previously on the psychology of entrepreneurship. And I'm not saying this in this kind of bullshit way. I don't care about money. Of course, I care about money. Like I want to go on on nice holidays to fancy places and like you know be very comfortable and buy nice things. Like who doesn't want to do that? Like I absolutely love all those things. But when the outcome becomes the money, then I feel completely drained. Simon, look what you're doing. Like you're talking about starting a tea company. It's like of course you want to be a healer. You know, I think that I'm very lucky and blessed to be in a business where every you know product that we sell, every box of product, where we know for a fact that like it's doing good for somebody. It's nefarious, man. Like the brain works in fucked up ways. The mind is one of the most deceiving, manipulative pieces of equipment, flesh, human bodies on earth. I never have trusted my brain. All of that weight lives in your head. You are the decision maker. Psychology of entrepreneurship. Hi, it's Ronsley. If this is your first volume, welcome. This is a weekly series where I go inside the mind of an entrepreneur, artist, athlete, academic to decipher what is the psychology of our decisions. I'm Australian and I'd like to acknowledge our traditional custodians of country where I live and work. I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and acknowledge our continuous connection and contribution to land, sea and community. All right. Today, we have the best of both worlds. This is our live conversation recorded in front of a live audience about solving the world's most meaningful problems. And yes, you are correct in saying that this is a really broad topic, Ronsley. Yes, I know. But hindsight is always 2020, especially in 2021. <laughs> uh, okay, not funny. Anyway, here is what I'd like you to know. This is a live conversation that happened on Clubhouse and I would love you to join us. But the good thing is that we captured the conversation amongst some amazing humans that were on this panel. Here is a bit of a list of some of their achievements. We had a gentleman who cares about the planet and sustainability and whose Netflix special season one viewed over 70 million times. We had someone who's intent on focusing on a healthier world uh, has generated over $100 million in revenue for their clients, a human that works and is succeeding on creating a waste-free future. We had someone that focuses and works on helping leaders build trusting teams. We had a lady that helps her clients deal with grief, a five-time best-selling author that has multiple businesses and is a very successful entrepreneur. And we also had a coach that helps clients break through their mental blocks amongst other people that were on the panel whose voices we couldn't have here today in uh, the recording. But I'm not even going to start highlighting all their achievements because it isn't about them as much as it is about the conversation we are having. And I think you should join us and we would love to hear your voice. I would love to hear your voice on Clubhouse live. And we are live usually every Monday morning, 9 a.m. Sydney time, 8 a.m. Brisbane time right now. Brisbane is on uh, daylight savings, but I do multiple events there. And amongst other live events I host on Clubhouse, you should kind of follow me at Ronsley and also find and follow the club uh, at the Psychology of Entrepreneurship because uh, we've got a club and we've got over like almost 4,000 followers. So that's amazing. So follow us on Clubhouse on the Psychology of Entrepreneurship Club. So this is the best where we can talk about a topic and I can invite my smart friends and a conversation develops. So here's the highlight reel of a long 90 minute conversation that we had. And we start with Darren O'Lean, the co-host of the Netflix series Down to Earth with Zac Afron, And he's talking about self-awareness. It's so interesting even presenting this as a question, solving the world's pro- most meaningful problems. And, uh, and I love it. And at the same time, it's, uh, you know, there's the overwhelm of even trying to consolidate the complexity <clears throat> into having uh, a meaningful conversation because you can go down so many different rabbit holes. But I think that can we solve all these problems right here, right now on this conversation? No, but what we can raise our level of consciousness and awareness. And, and honestly, the, you, can, you can point at many different 
you know, words to point at this, but I think the awareness and or consciousness, as well as obviously it relates to unconsciousness within our own uh, individual sphere is probably the greatest uh, thing I would think is the most powerful to change the world and change the quote unquote problems into opportunities, solutions. So I think the human spirit, the human consciousness, the, the, the very conversation we're having about poking at this idea that, you know, look at, look at, look at the world. There's, there's a lot of unconsciousness, but there's also a lot of consciousness around people making some horrible decisions in the world right now. And it's, and it's affecting all of us. So I think then it goes back to how we respond individually. Um, and, and we got to take care of our house. And our house is the things that we can do to respond. The, the responsibility we can do to take care of our own happiness, our own sovereignty. Um, and there's a lot we can do there. Um, water, power, food, shelter, self-awareness, kindness, optimism, um, creation, creativity, coming together in ideas, concepts, and creating actions within that. And so I think everything falls from that. Everything is created from that self-awareness, um, from that self-responsibility, um, because that gets us up and out of victimization. You know, it's I love this idea that it's so easy. I, I too fall victim of all of the news, all of the social crap that's out there. And really, it's about let's form and cultivate an ability to form solutions for what we are seeing as issues now more than ever. And so I think that, uh, if I could surmise it to say that, that I'm talking about right now is probably the greatest thing from my perspective that we can do to change the world's problems. That is self-responsibility, self-care, and then that creates a whole different serendipity, magnetism, opportunity, creativity, joining together with like-minded people to then solve the details of life. And that is water, power, food, shelter, people are suffering, they've suffered before COVID, they suffer after COVID, they're, you know, they're all kinds of different things that we've ultimately failed at, because people are still dying um, of of things that they don't need to as our global humanity. So anyway, I'm just going to pause it there. But, but the human spirit, the the self responsibility, the man in the mirror, the woman in the mirror, um, is, is, I think, the place and the most powerful place to start. Yes, when you change the way you look at the world, the world you look at changes. I think that's a Wayne Dyer quote that I remember. But going on from that point, my friend Yuri Elkane uh, jumped in about health being the most important and understanding our own health being so vital. But, well, here's Yuri. This is something I firmly believe with every fiber of my being. And I think it's it shows up in how people respond to donation pledges and, and charity fundraising, where people think, well, there's no way my donation is going to make a difference. Um, but they, we've also seen with a lot of research that if we position those campaigns as your donation is going to help this one individual, all of a sudden, the, the ability and willingness to give is much greater because we feel like we're making an impact. So the, the biggest area where I've been focused in the last 20 years is obviously health. And obviously now we help health entrepreneurs uh, get their message out to more people. But you know, with everything that's happened with COVID, I, I think it's there's been a lot of poor leadership, I think, from around the world. And we've been trying to solve a strategic problem with tactical band-aids. And, you know, whether you believe in vaccines or not, or social distancing or not, or whatever or not, I think the fundamental problem is that human beings know more about their car than they do about their body. When you buy a car, you have an owner's manual. You understand where to put the windshield wiper fluid, and you understand what this indicator light means on the dashboard. 
but very few humans understand what symptoms mean on their own body. I believe that's a fundamental flaw of the human experience so far. And going back to what Darren said about, you know, we have to look at the person in the mirror. All change starts with ourself. I believe that, you know, whether it's a COVID pandemic or anything else, if you look at the school system, the way kids are brought up, they're not taught anything about nutrition, nothing about health, nothing about, you know, whatever. That's a fundamental issue. Like that, like, I don't even know if that can be solved systemically. So what can we do as individuals? Well, I think as individuals, number one, we have to take the ownership, no matter how old we are, to better inform ourselves about how our body works. Number two, we have to be the example to actually live that way. And then if we are parents to children, we have to be the school. We can't expect the school system to teach our kids the things, morals, values, uh, like the, the basics of human anatomy and physiology and good nutrition and health and mindfulness and being a good person, they're not going to learn any of that stuff in school. As parents, we have the opportunity to be their teachers, but we can't just be their teachers. We need to be their models. We have to role model. We have to exemplify what that means. And the thing is like, none of this stuff is going to make a difference in the next generation, right? Me being a great role model to my kids, I'm going to impact four kids, Right? They're going to grow up and hopefully they're going to impact their kids. And maybe by shining their light, if they end up in the world of health, maybe they'll help you know, millions of people. But it's still, it's such a systemic problem that it's not going to be solved, I don't think, in our lifetime. But it doesn't mean that it can't start and it shouldn't start with us. So I think when we look at you know, things like these various diseases that are happening or viruses, like they're going to be around with us forever. But what we can do, what we have 100% control over is, hey, well, what if I just took care of my own health? What if I got a bit more vitamin D? What if the government's actually subsidized proper nutrition and exercise compared to all this other stuff? I mean, these are obviously very philosophical, political questions, but I think at the end of the day, there's no sense in complaining about what the government's going to do because it's not going to be what we want them to do. We have to take charge in our own life, in our own homes, to be the example, to live the life we want to see other people live. And I think slowly but surely, that's where it's got to start. And hopefully down the road, between that and becoming more conscious individuals, I think that's how we make the planet a better place, you know, one generation at a time. A team of British scientists evaluated the relationship between health behaviors and mortality in a group of around 20,000 men and women. The volunteers ranged in age from 45 to 79 years when the study began, and none had been diagnosed with cardiovascular disease or cancer. The scientists focused on four health habits, not smoking, being physically active at work or in leisure time, eating at least five servings of fruits and vegetables a day, and consuming one to 14 alcoholic drinks a week. During a follow-up period that averaged 11 years, People with none of the four good habits were four times more likely to die than people who had all four healthy behaviors. That means a 74-year-old man with all four healthy habits had the same death rate as a 60-year-old with none of the desirable behaviors. In effect, having all four destructive behaviors was equivalent to shaving 14 years off the calendar. And it doesn't have to be all or nothing. As compared to having none of the desirable traits, having even two cut the death rate by more than half. Most of the benefit came from protection against cardiovascular disease and cancer. Once we had that conversation going, Matt Batuli, who is one of the co-founders of Pila, in which Jay-Z and Beyonce are investors and makes beautiful products that don't create waste, as well as Trevinia Baba, who places some of the most talented people on the planet. And as well as Yuri, they go into really deep conversation about real problems and the shift in perspective that is important for us all to have. Here's Matt. Here's the real truth, right? The, the world's biggest problems, is it's different based on who you're asking. And Yuri, what you just said, I, I totally agree. I think, and I what Darren said to start, it, it does start with an awareness and a consciousness. It, unless, yes, about yourself and all that is great. But like people aren't even aware of what are the world's biggest problems. Like the world, not America, not first world Europe, but like the world. You know, there's seven point some billion people on the planet and they don't give a shit. Like a good chunk of them don't give a shit about 
their personal health. They care about clean water and sanitation or, you know, reliable energy. Um, they care about the fact that it's not about whether they go outside to get vitamin D, it's that they go outside and their beach is covered in plastic. Um, like these are big problems that, you know, how like eating real food, everyone on this call, if you're not eating real food, that's your fucking problem. You're wealthy enough to have a phone, an iPhone actually, cause it's clubhouse and you need to have an iPhone. So the world's biggest problems tend to not actually impact first world people. Not first, right? Like Darren's traveled around the world. I, I watched the show. It was great. And when, when you see what's going on around the world, you realize that like the stuff that we're, that we should collectively be working on doesn't actually impact us first or worst. You know, I was watching a, an entrepreneur on his Instagram feed complain about his boat. And he said, somebody commented like hashtag first world problems. And he said, yeah, but there's still problems. And I was like, no, dirt, you know, dirt bag. It, that's an inconvenience that your boat isn't working. The fact that some people don't have clean water, that's a problem. Um, and so I think that that's where the, the conversation needs to shift. So I thank you so much for bringing it up and that our problems that we consider our problems are actually probably just inconveniences. And if we're going to solve the real problems of the world, we have to have global collaboration, right? And, and Yuri, I absolutely agree. It belongs with us first, right? Ourself first, then we can move out locally and then globally um, as a whole. But I think that we need to figure out what problems we're actually solving. And it's not whether or not we have an iPhone 12 plus, whatever it's, you know, does someone have, um, have to worry about their child being shot at a school? Yeah, right. Shervinia, just one note on that too. Like if we think of like, and I agree with you guys, like, yeah, there's bigger problems. But the thing is humans are selfish, right? We care about what's in it for us. And if you think of um, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, the base of the pyramid is where most people are living, right? Yeah. Food, safety, shelter. And they're not going to care about global warming if they can't cover their own bills. And, you know, that's, I mean, this is the, I guess for me, the conundrum is like, how do you solve global big issues when most people are only concerned about making it to tomorrow? The same way that you solve any other problem is it's, it's, about a stri- it's about stringing together a whole bunch of small little yeses in order, right? To wind up, like, what, what, trying to solve big problems by asking people to change behavior is never going to work. We have to, we have to like gently shift it over time Right. And it does start with first world, first world countries, because that's where the majority of the wealth is. And it does start with individuals. And Darren nailed that it. it starts with an awareness around it. But then it actually, we need to quickly get to a place where it's relatable. And that whole thing about people are selfish, I agree. It's about, like, I think the solution to a lot of problems is going to come from entrepreneurs. It's going to come from creatives who are using business as the mechanism, not charity. I think charities are largely yeah. useless, right? And, and I think it starts with us uh, making it and use the tools. Like, Yuri, you just nailed an important one. And Darren, I want to hear your thought on this. Like, when we look at an individual and asking them to, like, be better or do better, and you're, we're all entrepreneurs here, the way that we do that is by showing them benefit, right, and value and outcome. And we know that as marketers and entrepreneurs, but for some reason, when we talk about larger global problems, we don't speak in terms of hope and inspiration and education and entertainment. We only talk in fear and, oh, we all need to move a mountain. Like we all need to show up tomorrow and be the world's best Olympic athlete at being good. And I don't think that's the way to go. with this audio documentary has always been to build a strong community of entrepreneurs and creatives to provide a space where they can use their voice to share their authenticity with the world. As a valued listener, your voice matters too. We love to hear your feedback and ideas. So don't be shy to let us know how we're doing in the ratings and comments. 
If you have a message for our production team or know someone who would be a perfect fit as a guest, you can find out more information on how to share your input at psychologyofentrepreneurship.com. This panel would not be complete without talking about something that happens to every single one of us. None of us are spared. <laughs> this is Tracy Ivanshin. Thank you so much, Ronsley. I love having this conversation. And I think that, you know, right now it's so timely because, of course, there's so much loss in the world. And, you know, there's all kinds of, you know, thoughts out there about how the whole world is grieving. You know, there's just layers uh, upon layers, losses, you know, even before COVID without that, you know, the loss of our health for other reasons and losses of partnerships or losses of marriage, loss of mental wellness, you know, all kinds of different losses, loss of key person in your company, deep friendships, you know, loss of trust. And then of course, loss of life, which is, which is the big one. And um, I think that, you know, um, there's, there's a lot of thoughts out there about how, you know, death is certain. And it's only the timing, which is uncertain. And so every day, we're just, you know, we're another day closer. And the thing is that there's research that shows that towards the end of life, you know, regardless of gender or uh, faith or um, various different cultures, you know, there's it really boils down. People tend to, if they get a chance to sort of sit quietly, they tend to ask themselves two questions. And, you know, there's various versions of this question, of course, but the two questions that people ask, um, and they're multi-layered, of course, but most people ask the same two. And one is, am I loved? And the second one is, have I loved well? And I think when people have a chance to sit with um, those two questions, um, and I think it's good to ask these questions. It's one of those things, it's an exam you don't want to cram for at the very end. You know, if we ask ourselves these questions today, when we believe we've got lots of runway to um, ask the question and maybe answer it in a way that, you know, we feel more comfortable with, I think that that's a really good use of our time. And, you know, Yuri, you were saying earlier that we want to live our lives, you know, fully the way we want to live them because we know that our time is finite. So I think that asking ourselves important questions, and I guess I call them, you know, asking ourselves the gentle questions about death that sort of inform the way that we live. Um, I think that's a really important thing. And I think a lot of people around the globe are, are asking these questions if they have the time to be quiet with them. While all this was going on, Dr. Lindsay Padilla brought up the important point that while we were talking about solving the world's most meaningful problems, race, minorities, and underrepresentation were topics to consider. And that we had no black people on the panel. So we invited the amazing Sean Croxton to add to a conversation that was really getting going. This is Sean. I think it's really important to, uh, for my, my people, my black people to not make it everybody else's responsibility to put us on stage. I think that we need to raise our hands and put ourselves on the stage. I think we need to take responsibility for ourselves and our businesses and put our messages out there and stop blaming other people for the fact that we're not doing what we really want to do. You know, I, I see things very, very differently than, than most people. You know, I'll just give you an example. Um, there was... Um, an article that came out on Medium maybe, maybe about six months ago. And it was about how the Mindshare group that JJ Virgin and others run was some racist group. And I've actually been a part of that group. And most people are really, really cool to me. They're very, very nice people. And one of the things that was said about this group is that they had no Black people on staff. And the person who sent in the statement from Mindshare said that nobody had ever applied. No Black people. Like, I've never had a Black person apply for a job with me. So am I underrepresenting under African Americans because they haven't applied for a job with me? So I think, again, it, we have our own power. And I think as Black people, we don't exercise that power enough. We don't take enough responsibility. We don't get ourselves on stage. And sometimes, especially there's a lot of people, my people, who look at life through a filter of racism. 
And you guys know what I'm talking about. Some are probably shaking their heads, but I bet you do. there's a lot of silent nods going on right now. Like everything is racist these days. And the fact is like everything is not racist. You know, no one's going to come up to you and be like, hey, do you want a job? No one's going to come up to you and be like, hey, do you want to come on stage for Clubhouse? You have to make yourself seen and you have to make yourself heard. And we have the power to do it. And we need to stop. Like, we need to, we need to have a, a, the discussion of other people like trying to raise us up. I think that needs to get turned down and we need to raise ourselves up. That's my thoughts. 80% of my customers are, are white people. And they love me. You know, um, just as an aside here, because I think this is a really important point. On my show, the Court of the Day show, real educated, amazing Black man, 70-year-old Black man, uh, just a wise dude named uh, Dr. George C. Fraser was on the show. And he, of course, was talking about uplifting Black people and us getting our confidence back and us knowing our history, right? And he told the story of Toni Morrison, the Pulitzer Prize winner, Nobel Prize winner, she was being interviewed by Charlie Rose. And Charlie Rose asked her about like what it's like to be a, a victim of racism. And she says, I've never been a victim of racism. She says, I've known for the last 50 years since my dad taught me that racist people are insane. You know, racist people are insane. Like, why do we give so much energy to racist people? Why do we give so much energy to bigots? I don't understand why we do this. Like, insane people are going to be insane people. What they need is therapy. So I don't spend my time thinking about racists. I don't spend my time thinking about me not being represented. I spend my time uplifting people so they have the confidence to be seen and heard. And I think that's where the discussion needs to be. In research published by JPAL, a global research center working to reduce poverty by ensuring that policy is informed by scientific evidence. It highlights how racial discrimination continues to be pervasive in cultures throughout the world. Researchers examined the level of racial discrimination in the United States labor market by randomly assigning identical resumes, black sounding or white sounding names, and observing the impact on requests for interviews from employers. Results found that resumes with white sounding names received 50% more callbacks than those with black sounding names, indicating that all other things being equal, considerable racial discrimination exists in the American labor market. Finally, to wrap up the conversation, almost 90 minutes, and I think we went into the two-hour mark. Uh, we had Daniel Priestley give us a very practical way every entrepreneur can make the world a better place. From your heart, as well as from your head, while you're solving the most meaningful problem for you in the world. And with that said, too, I'm involved in a few initiatives that I'm really proud of here in London. Uh, today, I was talking to one of the members of House of Lords um, and we're coordinating some of the um, unused, extremely valuable high, high-end high retail space in London um, on some of the most exclusive locations in London uh, to feature um, BME business-owned uh, fashion businesses, homeware businesses, and, and actually create uh, champions and, and essentially... Uh, inspira- inspirational entrepreneurs who are uh, who are underrepresented and essentially creating a campaign based on the idea that people can't be what they can't see. So, you know, if we can elevate and showcase more examples of, of really great um, entrepreneurs who are normally not showcased, then, then that's going to lead to a lot of inspiration. So I'm very proud of those kind of projects. The broader topic for me is that I run an accelerator with the mission of developing entrepreneurs that stand out, scale up and make a dent in the universe. And the way that we measure that is that we get entrepreneurs to choose two of the United Nations global global goals. There's 17 UN global goals. um, And we ask them to choose one for the head, one for the heart, and to find out what what exists at the intersection of that. So what is there at the intersection of, of a head related uh, a problem that draws your intellect and what is at the intersection of, of a heart related problem that draws draws your passion your your um, intuition and then try and blend the two and try and find out what you can do to make a dent at that intersection um, it's been an incredibly powerful um, experiment to watch over the last 10 years we've had three and a half thousand entrepreneurs who have taken that challenge and who have grown as a result and who have grown as, as leaders and entrepreneurs and as business owners and as success stories. 
Um, just this week, we've had uh, one of our clients change the law in the UK to allow women to get the contraceptive pill without a GP prescription. It's a first in the world uh, as far as that change to the law. Um, and she successfully lobbied that and it's, it's going to be a world-changing um, change. Uh, we had uh, one of our clients who has just donated 7 million sanitary kits to women living in refugee camps um, around the world. And, uh, you know, it's an amazing business that is actually doing that as a percentage of its growth. So the way, the way that it actually donated 7 million sanitary kits was through the growth of the business. So the success of the business is actually fueling that ability to make an impact and make a dent. All of the sanitary kits are plastic free, so none of it ends up in landfill. Um, you know, and that was also an innovation from one of our clients. Um, so, you know, for me, my whole mission in the world is developing entrepreneurs that stand out, scale up and make a dent in the universe. And um, I believe that entrepreneurship is the greatest vehicle ever created for, for creating sustainable and expansive change. In many ways, capitalism is a, is a close neighbor. Um, and capitalism is, you know, the deployment of cash, the deployment of capital. Entrepreneurialism is the deployment of spirit. Um, and, and passion and enthusiasm and resourcefulness. And it's closely linked, but it, it's actually quite different. And I think that the ability for entrepreneurs to create lasting and sustainable and scalable change in the right direction is probably the thing that we will, <laughs> that will most get us to where we need to be as a, as a humanity, as a planet. So it's, it's um, yeah, it's a, it's a very meaningful um, purposeful job that I do uh, running this accelerator because it's it's very linked to what you're talking about. Psychology of entrepreneurship. Coming up on the psychology of entrepreneurship. I didn't find myself in my voice in my native language, Polish. I was always very talkative but I kind of didn't feel understood. You know, people talk about this thing called the bright, shiny object syndrome, as if we all need to avoid anything that interests us or anything that we're curious, because everything's a distraction and you have to just stay on focus, stay on task. I think real bravery is when a man or a woman stops and ask themselves, is this the life I want to live? Psychology of entrepreneurship. That conversation has been a little slice of heaven. So we're going to do more of those. And if you're interested to hear them live and join us live, and we would love to hear your voice in whatever capacity it allows us to, please Follow the Psychology of Entrepreneurship Club on Clubhouse and also follow me at Ronsley. It would be amazing to get you on and get your perspective on different things. In the meantime, go have fun. Psychology of Entrepreneurship. This is a Must Amplify production. Special thanks to every guest expert that has appeared on the show. Editing, voiceovers, and sound design by Kaylee Bunnyman and Tiago Vega. Guest research by Jenna Elliott. Content by Corinne Castles. Project managed by the legend that is Kaylee Bonnyman. Produced and hosted by me, Ron Slivas. For more episodes and way to listen, go to mustamplify.com slash P-O-E. Love the polished audio docuseries style of this podcast, The Psychology of Entrepreneurship? At We Are Podcast, you can learn how to create a similar style for your own show. This revolutionary virtual event assembles podcasters, entrepreneurs, and marketers in one spot, so you're able to learn from the masters. Head straight to wearepodcast.com to reserve your spot at our next event. Are you still listening? Here's a little gift to you for sticking around. Uh, as well as Trevinia Baba, who replaces, as well as Trevinia Baba, who places some of the most talent, as well as Trevinia Baba, who places some of the most talent.